let's get started. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Antonucci. I am also part of the 475 class. And for those of you getting tired of us, I am the last member of the Billinger Brigade. So <laughs> you won't have to deal with us anymore after me. All right, uh, for my topic of study, I decided to, to uh, investigate, I titled my paper, Out Racing History, Auto Racing Facts and Myths in Charlotte, North Carolina. And one of the things that inspired this, en uh, this entire investigation was the NASCAR Hall of Fame. This is a, a rendering of what, they, of what it will look like when it is completely built. The NASCAR Hall of Fame will be placed in Charlotte, North Carolina. And one of the, what interested me, I am a NASCAR fan. I enjoy, I enjoy uh, watching the races. I've been to a few of them in my life. And when, uh, like, just as an idea, the, when I was younger, my dad took my family, everyone we went to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, but that was such a, it was a pretty big drive from where we lived. However, the NASCAR Hall of Fame will be in Charlotte, which is just up the road, so it can be like a day trip or anything. And also what interested me in this is when they were going through the entire marketing ploy trying to figure out where NASCAR was going to locate the hall, they used uh, the slogan of, racing was built here, racing belongs here. And the, th the thing about this, it was just uh, the idea of, it sounds, it sounds wonderful, it's, it's a great marketing idea, it belongs here, we built it. And uh, what interested me was, was it actually built here? Was, uh, was there anything about this? And just, uh, if you, I don't know how many of you actually read the Charlotte Observer sports section on a regular basis, but uh, the sports writers in there, during the time when they were trying to land the hall in Charlotte, they always brought up the entire idea of how racing had such a rich history in Charlotte, how the moonshiners in the North Carolina area did so much for the history of racing. It, at times it bordered on hero worship, and it was like, all hail, all hail. And it, ju it just intrigued me, the idea of, is this the truth? I mean, are we building it exclusively on just this marketing ploy? I mean, or is it true? Are they speaking the truth? And I came to the conclusion that while many historic racing events have happened in Charlotte, North Carolina, it's, and it is true that it is very rich in racing history, just to s say that it's exclusively built by the people in Charlotte, North Carolina, and by the moonshiners is wrong. Just, just to say it's exclusive is uh, wrong, it's, and that's the marketing gimmick. There, I'm not going to go out and say that it's completely false, that there is no truth at all whatsoever, just to say that you can't ignore the contributions of other people in other places and everything you have to always consider. Now, uh, when they were trying to decide, there were a couple of other uh, places that they were deciding on. Uh, first off, one of the uh, selections, Atlanta, Georgia. It was a southern racing hotbed. There was a speedway in there called Lakewood Speedway, which was uh, home to very many uh, very talented race car drivers who were very fa uh, famous. And there was also the idea of Richmond, Virginia, which is also the home of the uh, track. And the, it was the former capital of the Confederate States of America. The reason I include uh, that is because if you actually go to a NASCAR race uh, exclusively in the Deep South tracks, you can actually see almost as many of the Confederate flags as you can, like American flags, NASCAR banners. I mean, it is still a very important symbol. I mean, obviously the history behind it's kind of touchy, but the, just the ideas behind it, the freedom, the, rebe uh, the rebel ide ideal, I mean, there is still uh, one of the things that makes the Moonshiner ideal so popular is they love the, the Dukes of Hazard image of clouded dust out racing the cops with a load of hooch in your trunk. So, uh, one, uh, there is, uh, like, like I said, there is, it is, I'm not going to go out and say that Charlotte has nothing to do with it. It does have a great deal. Like, uh, for example, Osmond Barringer, which I don't have a picture of him, he was a Charlottean who uh, in 1900, he actually brought the first cars into the South. He was the first one to own them. He owned uh, what they were called locomobiles, which uh, they were kind of, the, the later models kind of looked like the little car piece you'd see in a Monopoly game, but the original things like he had, they kind of looked like uh, the carriages you might see uh, that horses might pull around. And also, uh, Osmond Barringer was, was excuse me was also uh, one of the key players in getting the first uh, Charlotte Speedway built. This is a picture of what the original Charlotte Speedway looked. It was actually located in Pineville, but it was considered Charlotte's Speedway, and it was a very a very famous track. In fact, it was actually at one point considered one the one of if not the fastest tracks in the world. It was it was a very big draw for many uh, famous racers, and they all came to drive there. 
And then later on, in, when NASCAR, the National Association of Stock Car Auto Racing, uh, was formed, the first race in what, what was then called the Strictly Stock Division, but is now called the Sprint Cup Division, was actually held in Charlotte. And this is a picture of the first race. The, the Strictly Stock Division was, uh, by definition, the only cars that were eligible to race in that division were cars that you could, in theory, just kind of leave the speedway, go to an auto dealer, and just buy that car. The, the intention was any car you could see on the track there was one you could drive yourself. And actually later on, many of the automakers in Detroit saw NASCAR as a great marketing gimmick because the most successful cars were the ones that were getting the biggest deal. So, so you can, Charlotte does have a very big influence in racing in NASCAR, but there are other considerations. But uh, like I said, Charlotte, very successful as well. And the moonshiner myth, the second of the two myths that I concern myself with, the, it was generally believed that they, uh, they were the only people, like I said, the hero worship and all that stuff. The, in fact, David Poole, who was one of the, the beat writer, I guess, for NASCAR, for the Charlotte Observer, he, every time he gets the chance, he brings it up. Uh, there was like a month and a half ago, there was a little report that he did as kind of a sidebar story of how this little dirt track that NASCAR has nothing to deal with, it's just a little thing, they found a still on it and he said, some things never change. So it was, it was, his, it was his shining moment to, we must bring this back and everything. And even, even in the early years of NASCAR, it was a very popular stereotype. Uh, Ned Jarrett, who was an early champion, his son became very successful in NASCAR. He, when, he said, when he told his father he was going to go race on the NASCAR circuit, his father said that people who race cars are either bootleggers or fools. And Ned Jarrett had no uh, connection to the moonshiners at all. He was not a moonshiner. He didn't ship it. He didn't have any of that. And the truth of the matter was, while there were some successful drivers, the first major champions in NASCAR were not moonshiners. Uh, Red Byron, who was the first champion in the Strictly Stock Division, he had no, uh, no moonshining credentials. His, his big claim to fame was that he had been a tail gunner in World War II and had been shot down and won a Purple Heart. I mean, his thing was more American hero as war hero rather than moonshiner outlaw type thing. And Bill Rexford, who he's not often talked about in uh, major history discussions, but he was the second guy to win the championship, and he was born in New York. He had no moonshine connections at all. So uh, you can, uh, it's kind of big guys that are really putting it all on the map. They're not moonshiners. They aren't filling in on this myth. But, uh, but I'm not. But again, I'm not going to say it's completely false. There are there is some truth to, uh, to some of this part. <coughs> Uh, Lloyd C., who, uh, Bill France, the guy who is generally credited with founding NASCAR, he's the guy who pretty much started the organizational process, he was a moonshiner in the 20s, and Bill France called him uh, the greatest uh, driver who ever lived. And, uh, he, and he actually died in a moonshine deal gone awry. He actually, uh, he actually died because of the moonshining business. Then there were the Flock brothers, Bob Fonny and Tim, who were all very successful drivers, all who had, were, uh, did moonshine, and Tim, in fact, became champion at different times. And then the final one, he was the last major one, Junior Johnson, who, if you have any big discussion on recent moonshining, the Junior Johnson's name is bound to come up. In fact, while I was uh, investigating this, I actually went through the Charmec uh, newspaper archives, and uh, Junior Johnson's name popped up more than just about anyone else in this regard. Uh, there were there were interviews with him, people discussing his life. They even, I even found an article from a state trooper who once uh, made an entire career out of chasing him down and never caught him. So uh, he was very, very influential, and he's, he later became one of the most successful team, uh, team owners. But uh, these are only small guys, and once you get to around Junior Johnson, they were just not there anymore. They, the moonshiners just weren't popping up on the tracks anymore. So they would start, they were pretty much by the time of like the Flock Brothers in the early 50s, the moonshiners as successful racers at the top levels, they were a dying breed. They were just not happening anymore. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, there's, like, like I said, I'm not gonna, I cannot stand up here and say there is no influence, these myths are wrong. I cannot say that, but I can say they're incomplete. They have other parts to them that obviously 
when you're get, trying to get the Hall of Fame like this, it's going to be such a big thing for the city of Charlotte from an economic standpoint. They're pl already playing on jobs, tourism dollars, all this thing. But obviously, they're not going to investigate this stuff because it'll hurt their chances. But it's more a, more a case of if you want to be correct historically, like if, if I want to have the, the milk drink to my colleague's peanut butter sandwich, I can, uh, I'm going to stand up here and say that there is some truth there, but you can't just say it's done. Let's deal with it. So, and that's it. Any questions? Well, the Daytona 500 actually didn't even start until the 1950s. So, and my entire aim was more in the case of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County, this area. Uh, if you're going to talk about the big moonshining thing. Atlanta, Georgia was a much bigger hotbed for the moonshiners because of Lakewood Speedway. A lot of them would race at Lakewood Speedway and then actually a lot of them started shifting to come up to Charlotte to race because Lakewood Speedway actually had a thing where they banned criminals from their races and unfortunately a lot of the moonshiners had been caught at one time or another. So they all had a criminal records so they had to leave and that actually was Charlotte's gain because they were gaining all these top flight drivers. Well, they were, they were moonshiners, yes, and they were actually very famous because everyone said these are the famous guys, let's go and watch them. But uh, I, for time of period, uh, from dates that I was actually looking for, I didn't really have a set date for it. I was more looking, uh, Charlotte, uh, first track of 1924, that was their first Charlotte track, even though it was located in Pinewood. I was more looking for connections to, that the Moonshiners had to these races. Uh, so, uh, just kind of a little extra connection. The, moon, uh, the first guy to ever win that for, uh, Charlotte race in 1949, which was the NASCAR race, he was, named, he was named Glenn Dunaway, and he wasn't a moonshiner, but he was eventually disqualified from that win because they found out that his car had been modified to moonshiner statistics. So they, so they actually took the car away from because it wasn't a strictly stock car. But I was, I was more looking just for connections rather than actual dates. It was more... Uh, for the moonshiner method, it was just an idea of what moonshiners were actually racing at the very top levels of racing at their time, how successful were they, was there anyone who was routinely beating them, and Red Byron, who I mentioned, he was routinely beating them. So it was, it was more a case of how successful are they being, as opposed to just the entire package of dates and everything. <laughs> I don't know if it's anything about separate stereotypes. I think it's just kind of one of those effects where over time images get inflated and pumped up and they say this is, it's much nicer to believe this thing to actually go in and go after the truth. Like, uh, like uh, when I was going through my research, another of the Observer sports writers, Tom Sorensen, he actually made uh, the comment right after Charlotte had been awarded the Hall of Fame. He actually said, there has to be a special wing on this, in this building that serves alcohol, and the alcohol has to be tax-free, because it's a way of celebrating the history of the moonshiners and everything. Uh, so I wouldn't say they were actively going out to create different stereotypes. More, they just loved that original stereotype image of the rebel, the outlaw, outracing the cops and everything. Anything else? Thank you.